That is recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October edition, October 21 uh, edition of the Transceiver Speaker Series hosted by New School Policy and Design for Outer Space. My name is Nick Travellini. I'm one of the co-chairs of the group here at the New School, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Adam Dippert to speak with us tonight, uh, otherwise known as the Space Juggler. Uh, Adam is a longtime uh, artist uh, in the circus and kinesthetic arts. Uh, he is also a PhD in physics and has spent his time the last few years developing the art and techniques and theory of space juggling and thinking about how this embodied, this new mode of embodiment in low gravity or no gravity uh, spaces allows for new ranges and development of artistic practice. And we're so grateful that he will speak with us tonight about this research and about this work and where what he's done so far and where hopefully where he's going to be able to take it in the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Adam. Thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Nick. And uh, thanks to everybody else for uh, coming to check this out and for hearing a little bit about uh, the kind of stuff that I've been exploring. Um, I, uh, yeah, I am, I'm really excited about this because this is kind of still an evolving story. Um, and so, although uh, I think it's come a long way in the last eight years as I've developed things and, and really been focused on space juggling for the last two years, uh, I keep finding new channels. Uh, through which to explore it, and um, and so I'm I, I I've realized that one of the things I want this work to facilitate for other people is just kind of like being uh, a source of motivation or a source of like uh, inspiration to look at something that has been explored really thoroughly in depth, and um, I've approached it from a dot, lot of different angles, and you'll see that this evening. Um, but I keep coming back to it and, and finding more questions to ask. And I just really hope that uh, people are finding this experience in their own work, that regardless of how long you've been investigating, whatever it is that you're interested in, that um, you know, it remains a source of curiosity and a source of inquiry. And that can happen through um, you know, your own inquisitiveness and your own capacity to approach it from different angles. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of one of the main messages um, that I'm feeling about space juggling right now. Um, so I just want to do a little video check here. Uh, this, this is a little video um, of the type of artwork that we're going to be um, talking about. And, um, and so you can see it's like juggling in the sense that uh, I'm throwing balls and it is... Um, working with the uh, rules of object movement in space in the sense that um, these balls are, are moving in straight lines. Of course, when you're looking at them, you're not seeing straight lines because the camera is rotating with me as my body is spinning. And so um, we're gonna get into kind of some more details about that um, throughout the work, but this is the uh, kind of inertial reference frame where you can see the balls moving in straight lines while uh, my body is actually spinning in a circle. And so uh, without further ado, that is space juggling. Um, so my name is Adam Dipert, and I kind of have been working around this theme of circus science and zero gravity. Uh, on the left side, you can see me juggling five balls. On the right side, you can see me um, doing partner stilting acrobatics, um, a technique that I developed for a number of years with a um, a fellow circus performer. Uh, so that's me holding her up above my head. And then in, in the center, you can see an, uh, a science experiment that I built, um, which goes inside of a cryostat. And I was measuring uh, magnetic fields of helium-3 um, as we did uh, you know, nuclear magnetic resonance operations on the helium-3. And I, I still work in that field and do a, a lot of helium-3 stuff. Um, uh, and now I'm at uh, North Carolina State University. Okay, uh, so more interesting than hearing about me is hearing about uh, why 
would I even begin working on movement in altered gravitational environments? And um, this, I mean, it started as a, uh, just a physical investigation, but then as I dug into the physical experience of it, um, I realized kind of like a lot of other levels that were having to be challenged as a result of that. And so, um, so I actually like going kind of from the end first to say like, what's the overarching thing that I think this does for humanity. And then, um, and then I'll get into more of the details as we, as we move on. So, um, for, for me and for just kind of like this branch of inquiry, um, I really love exploring movement in altered gravitational states because it's super non-intuitive because I have to turn left when I think turn right. Uh, I have to, you know, pause my reactions and then engage in a thoughtful manner. Um, I think this work is important for the future of human space exploration. Um, and I think in the next couple of slides, I will convince you that um, there is something to be learned about what it means to be human through uh, asking questions about what it means to be in our bodies. Um, and gravity is, is a strong component of that. Um, and, and so we can't just jump to those types of conclusions. We really need to go through the steps to get there. Um, and I think Nietzsche said it very nicely. He who would learn to fly one day must first learn to stand and walk and run and climb and dance. One cannot fly into flying. So we have to like, you know, get there through a natural progression. And I think that's the best, that's one of the things I love so much about exploring movement and then finding out what it means is that uh, I don't have to come in with any philosophical objective. You know, I'm not trying to prove anything to you or to anybody else. I'm just um, going in and exploring movement and then looking at it and saying, well, what, what does that mean to me? Um, or hearing what other people have to say about what it means to them. Um, so uh, let's just start with this idea of the physical as being like the basis of where um, other things arise. And so um, physical parameters in our environment have a direct influence on our subjective analysis of the world, on the types of problem solving strategies we employ, employ um, our metaphorical construction of the world, as well as things that help us with our self-identification. And although we... Um, you know, may have a structure that works, it's important for us to remember that like different types of structures teach us different types of things and they can all be very useful. And so um, I like to start out with remembering that uh, Euclidean geometry, which is what you would learn in high school, uh, was started in like 300 BCE and it was super useful. And that's, you know, just like rectilinear stuff. That's what you learn from Euclid, um, you know, starts out with four postulates and you can construct, you know, Cartesian coordinates and have a whole, you know, whole universe of, of useful mathematics that arises from it. Um, but then when you make a slight change to one of those rules and you start looking at it a little bit differently, then you get all of the branches of non-Euclidean geometry, which usually just take one of the four postulates of Euclidean geometry and then takes it out and then says, okay, what do we get if we just have these three rules or if we replace it with a different rule or something like that? Um, and non-Euclidean geometry is necessary for the development of Einstein's equations, which tell us about how the curvature of space-time actually works, which I'm willing to bet most of the people in this room are convinced that uh, a deep understanding of space-time is pretty important to the future of humanity. I mean, we even need that just to, you know, understand Mercury's orbit. And so, um, so it's important to, like, see that even if we already have useful working structures, it's still useful to change them and to figure out, you know, other structures that can teach us something different. And so um, often in our psychological and philosophical models of the human psyche and how you expect people to respond uh, in relationship to their physical parameters, you may think of things like age and culture and gender and skin tone or their religion or, you know, um, nationality or whatever, but we rarely include our gravitational orientation as a component of being a human and what we think of as our psychological and philosophical structures that make us be human and act like humans. And, you know, on the on the hopefully long term, if we succeed at getting into space, and if we, you know, go through the process of a speciation and get to see what it's like for other people to live in other gravitational environments, then we may have an opportunity to um, 
you know, deal with this firsthand. And hopefully it won't be a violent way of dealing with it, which is usually how humans in the past have ended up dealing with things. And so I'm just trying to shine a light on this now, you know, and just be like, hey, let's start thinking about this and, um, and you know, mentally prepare and as best a way as we can for a, a pretty uh, hopeful future where there will be people living across the solar system. Um, now, some ways that gravity has a direct influence on the way that you think, uh, I think are, are outlined very well by Lakoff and Johnson. Um, and so here are some gravitationally oriented metaphors that we use um, that we don't really give credit for the fact that these concepts are fully based on our interaction with gravity. Um, so one example is happiness is up, right? I'm feeling up today. Um, more is up. That's that one's pretty important. Uh, it gets used in a lot of ways that we don't really um, we don't really keep our you know keep track of the fact that we're relating number uh, numbers to height and um, and that more numbers or a larger volume of something means that we think of it as being higher than something else. Um, difficulties are burdens, right? And then also control is up. Right, that um, people on the top are, um, you know, making everybody else do something. This is a uh, this is a movement from the bottom, whatever. And there are some times that we actually don't even have any way about speaking about structures or about subjective um, concepts without using these types of gravitationally oriented metaphors, particularly in like the hierarchies of corporations. And um, I think that we need to shine a little light on that and, and take into consideration that gravity has having a direct influence on the way that we develop uh, a model of our social relationships. And that is not necessary. And so by understanding where these gravitational biases are influencing our concepts and our metaphors and our reasoning and our logic, and I, um, I, th I think pretty strongly our, our morality and our ethical codes, um, if we can identify where those gravitational biases are coming from, then we can start to look at them and analyze like which ones are useful to us, which ones do we actually want and which ones kind of, you know, are a, a thing of the past. And until 60 years ago, when people started going into space, we didn't have an embodied experience that facilitated a reason to take this type of thing sincerely and look at it and start to question it. And so um, I'm asking you all now, uh, you know, to consider if you would be interested in trying to disassemble some of your gravitational biases um, and, and understand where they're coming from so that you can choose, uh, you know, what type of ethical and, and conceptual world you wish to live in. Um, so, when we get down to the physical, right? That's that's what I started this out or somewhere in the, <laughs> in the line of things said, uh, this all starts with the physical, right? If we um, just move our bodies some way, then we under, then we can develop an understanding about, um, uh, you know, how that directly influences the, the structures that we um, develop in our minds, right? Our metaphors and such. Um, and the thing is, is that even simple things like rotations are not usually understood even by physicists. And so um, you can do this, what, what I'm about to show you, you can do this with your own phone at home. And so if you have your phone, oh, I was supposed to be pause, not jump back to the beginning. If you have your own phone, um, please feel free to pop it out and follow along, um, be on a couch or next to a bed or something, because uh, I am going to ask you to throw your phone. I'm not responsible for if you break your phone, uh, but this uh, could be, uh, you know, help you see uh, exactly what I'm talking about and why it's true. So if you hold your phone so that um, you're looking at it on the front, you can imagine that there are three vectors coming out of it. There's the blue vector, the red vector and the green vector, right? The blue one's coming out of the face, the red's coming out of the short end, and the green's coming out of the side. And we call the blue one the maximum axis, the red the minimum axis, and the green the intermediate axis. And why these are so important is that because when it rotates, for example, if you hold it on this long side and you spin it backward so that it spins around that um, small axis, right? Spins around the red one, this pink arrow is the angular momentum then you will see that you can spin your phone nice and stable. And that makes a lot of sense and we like that kind of thing. Now, if you hold it on the short end and you spin it around the face of the phone, right? 
um, this is uh, angular momentum is along with, aligned with the blue axis, then again, you'll see that it spins nice and stably. And these are the ways that we often imagine things rotate, is that you start spinning it and it spins stably. But we're going to do something different. Now you're going to hold it on the short end and you're going to spin it around the green axis so that the top of the phone spins back towards your face, right? Angular momentum is aligned with this axis. And what you're going to find is it's going to spin and then flip over in the middle of the spin and then spin and then flip over in the middle. And we call this the intermediate axis theorem. You probably have heard of it uh, before if you've looked at weird physics things. And that behavior is natural for all objects. Now, if we hold it in the corner and you throw it at just some random axis, right? Now, when you let go of it, it is gonna spin in a very complicated way. And, um, and it's just kind of like has a lot of stuff going on. But when you can visualize the orientation of these axes, then you can see, for example, that the red axis looks like it's just spinning in a circle. And in this way, if you understand this type of um, you know, mathematics, then you can predict how future behavior is going to be, even if it's moving in a complicated manner. So we're just going to look at those all one more time, uh, rotation around the minimum axis, the maximum axis, the intermediate axis, and then some random axis. Um, so remember, Minimum axis is nice and stable. Inter maximum axis is stable. Intermediate axis flips around in the middle. And then uh, random axis kind of has a lot more complicated of a pattern. And so when we consider moving with our bodies into weightlessness, these are the ways that our bodies are capable of rotating because we have the exact same rules as the phone. And so this was a model that I made, and I, I guess I didn't say that. La last thing was a um, virtual reality program that I wrote so that I could study um, movement and weightlessness. Um, and so this is another computer program that I wrote that uh, I wanted to calculate where the center of mass is on the human body in any position. And then I wanted to find out what the orientation of those maximum, minimum, and intermediate axes are, right? The blue, red, and green vectors, because those have a direct influence on the way that the body rotates. And so um, in this case, you see a person sitting with their left arm up and their right arm in their lap, and they're in a, a seated position. And so you can see the blue axis kind of goes up into the side. It points to the right side and um, if they lean all the way back, right, hold the arms behind their back and their knees behind their back or their ankles behind their back, um, then you can see that the, the blue arrow, the maximum axis, the most stable axis to rotate around is, um, is kind of like doing a backflip kind of pattern. Um, and I'll just mention that the place where all of these vectors are coming out of is the center of mass of the body. And that's, that's the point that you rotate around whenever you're um, freely floating in weightlessness. And so as I was playing around with this, of course, there's the most you know, simple situation um, where it's just a person in a standing position, which we may think of as kind of a default human position, note, gravity influencing the way that you think about uh, human and self-identification because you think of a human as being possibly standing. Um, the blue axis actually comes out of the belly and goes forward. And so I was looking at that and I thought, that's interesting. I've never seen anybody doing anything like that. Um, uh, what are my slides doing? There we go. No. That wasn't what I wanted. Okay. Um, and I actually hadn't seen uh, anybody spinning around uh, their belly like that, right? Because that type, type of spin is kind of like a cartwheel. Uh, and everybody always wants to do forward flips or they want to spin around the top of their head or something. And so when I noticed that this is the direction of the blue axis in the standing position, and this is the most stable axis you can rotate around, I also realized that this is the only way that you can spin and keep facing the same direction. Because every other way you spin, you're continuously facing in a different direction. Uh, and so this was a really key component in uh, the development of the idea of space juggling. Um, there are some videos online of astronauts juggling, like um, this video of him, uh, a couple of astronauts juggling fruit together, or this video of Richard Garriott um, and Greg Chaninoff, Chamintoff, um, juggling on the uh, space station. Um, but 
it doesn't seem like anybody has really gone all the way. Um, and so I knew that balls traveled in straight lines because, you know, when you're in weightlessness, uh, they don't travel in parabolas, right? They travel, uh, travel in straight lines. And I knew that the human body can rotate in this cartwheel kind of motion. And so I just started wondering like, what would happen if I threw balls down to myself while I spin in a circle? And, um, I have to, I guess at this stage, preface this by saying, uh, I have been on three parabolic flights. And so, uh, I have been exploring movement in weightlessness. And so this, um, structure kind of didn't pop into my head randomly. It was like after my first parabolic flight, um, when I was just studying how rotations happen. And so, um, once I had this vision for how this maximum axis rotation on the human body works, and I hadn't seen anybody else do it, I needed to confirm that this thing was possible. And so what you're seeing on the right is you're seeing a series of parabolas during which I was trying to get this rotation to happen. Um, because we all know that there's a much bigger difference between uh, knowing that something is possible, especially using math to do it, and actually succeeding at doing that thing, right? And so I really needed to go through the process of figuring out how do I get my body spinning around this axis? And I had some success uh, here. This, this is the second to last one I'm gonna show. And there you can see nice stable rotation around the maximum axis. Uh, I have a little bit of drift, obviously, toward the ceiling, and so that's um, that's a bit of a, you know, that's a challenge you have to overcome. But it took that many parabolas for me to succeed at this, and I've been a professional circus performer and acrobat since, you know, 2001, and this is hard, <laughs> right? And there's nobody to teach you uh, because the astronauts are not doing this type of stuff. Um, so, so I had these ideas, right? I wanted to do that. And, uh, and I wanted to spin in a circle. I wanted to throw balls down to myself. And I was talking to Story Musgrave and he's an astronaut um, who became an astronaut in 1967. And he was telling me about how, if you take a rope and you lay it on a flat surface and you roll it back, like uh, shake it back and forth, it moves the same way that it would move in space. And I had uh, been really deeply in a like training for zero G session, well, number of months where um, I was going to float tanks and wind tunnels and um, pools and uh, dance studios and working in aerial harnesses, like all the time, multiple times a day, lots of note taking, lots of development. And I just had all this equipment there and I was like, oh wait, I bet I could set myself up so that I could spin around my belly facing down roll a ball on the floor because then it would roll in the direction, you know, in a straight line, like it would in space. And then I could see what happens, right? I could see if this was an interesting topic or not. And, uh, as I started doing that, uh, I thought, yeah, this is kind of interesting. And so I just dedicated to doing it every day for six months with no expectations, uh, as in no judgment, just like, see what I find and, and, keep going and don't get too down on myself. And at this end of six months, um, I was pretty confident that I had something neat. Um, and I wanted to take it to the next, um, stage where I kind of evolved it a little bit. And here in this video, you can see what it looks like, um, to be spinning while, uh, rolling the balls on the ground. Um, and this was just supposed to be a practice, right. For when I actually go, uh, on a parabolic flight, because, um, it's really useful to practice things before you spend, you know, $10,000 trying to have six minutes to try them. Um, and so after I practiced on the floor, I thought, how can I make this better? Uh, I can get a camera in front of me. Uh, I could probably do that over a glass floor. Turns out glass floors are a stupid idea. Nobody's going to do that. Who wants to walk on a glass floor? Uh, and so I had to build my own uh, table here. And so we built this table that has um, some clear plastic that's pulled tight. And then I put the camera down below and I face the camera up and I look at myself um, and I can record it. And so I started recording this type of video and um, I had a lot of realizations as soon as I saw the film of it, which was not what I was expecting. You know, I was expecting the first person experience to be kind of like the primary experience in this art form, because, 
you know, it's vestibularly challenging. I'm spinning in a circle. I'm getting dizzy. I have to pay attention to a lot of stuff, all of that. Um, but once I moved onto this surface, not only did I move off of the floor, which was an infinite space, and now I had a confined space where there was now an edge, and now there was a middle, and now there was something for me um, to play against and to play within. So that was an important part of like this transition. But then also um, I could see what was happening and I could see the balls traveling in straight lines. And I asked a question, I thought, what if I spin the camera with me so that the camera stays aligned you know, with me as I'm spinning? And when I did that, it was the first time that I saw, um, I saw this and, you know, until now I've always, I've been reminding you that these balls are traveling in straight lines, right? But when I'm spinning and when you view it while spinning, it doesn't look like the balls are traveling in straight lines. And until I saw this video, I was not giving credit to this other perspective, right? I wasn't giving credit to this other reference frame where the balls are traveling in curves and that those curves are real, right? It is true that the balls are both traveling in straight lines and they're traveling in curves and those are not uh, in conflict. You know, the, and, and that I think is a, a really profound thing to realize that something as simple as balls traveling in lines can, uh, oh, what, we lost it, keep going, there we go. Balls traveling in lines and balls not traveling in lines can be a deeply philosophical, you know, underpinning about how we expect the world to operate. And so this is a video of me from the side so that you can see um, when you watch the video from below, even, even when we were recording it, um, the, uh, the crew that I worked with a lot would be watching it through the, the video feed and they'd just be like, oh, wow, this is really calm. This is like really cool, you know? And then they look up and they see me from the side and I'm, you know, spinning at like 10 to 40 RPMs while laying the balls on the ground while the lights are changing, while I, you know, all these things. And so it's just good to remember, like, this is actually what it looked like. And this is actually what I was doing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that is, yeah, that's something to know. So I wanted to, um, I had that video that you just saw and I just kept, I like, it was the pandemic by this time. I just was ready to keep going. And I got this opportunity to move into a barn. And so this is the barn. It's out in the country in North Carolina. Uh, this is the inside of it. It was built in the 1930s by some Quakers. Um, we built a new juggling surface, reinforced it a little bit. Here's the spreader bar that I hang from. I'm now hanging from the ceiling. Um, I designed some electronic equipment so that I could kind of make this like camera control structure a little bit easier. Um, this is actually a space juggling pattern here that you saw. This is the four ball. This is what happens when you throw balls parallel to each other. One kind of does this loop-de-loop -loop in the middle and one does this big loop around the outside. Um, got new harnesses. This is uh, the star field in the background before I got it uh, together. And then you can see my favorite, well, my, everything's my favorite, but one of my favorite parts was uh, we cut a hole in the floor and then we actually put the camera system under the floor. So it was seven feet away from me. Um, on the left side, you can see my, um, my model of it. And then on the right side, you can see the finished structure. And this included like building all of the um, motor controllers and everything uh, to control the camera as it's spinning with me. Um, and I did this with a really awesome crew uh, from left to right, Casey Torres. She worked on the costume. Middle is Alien John. Uh, really does a good job of putting up with me talking about uh, object manipulation math for long hours. And then on the right side is Jeremy. And then what you can see them all working on is um, the LED array um, because I had 1,350 LEDs lighting this whole structure. Um, and then just to note the videos that I'm showing you of space juggling at the end or at the beginning. And then what I'll show you after this, um, this is like basically straight out of the camera. And it's because of this whole thing that we made here. There's, there's no motion graphics or anything. Um, and then of course, like the last step in any really cool circus project is to make an awesome spacesuit. Uh, and so this is my spacesuit. And we designed it so that we could put the harness inside of the spacesuit. Uh, so that then when you kind of look at the space juggling 
you know, image. Um, you don't have to deal with the uh, looking at the uh, harness and remembering, you know, kind of the environment. This, this essentially is science fiction, right? Until somebody does it, at which point it's science fact. Um, but I have pinched out the like as close as I can get without actually being in space. Um, and so as I developed it, you know, um, I realized some mathematical properties of it. So remember, um, we started out with this um, topic that like balls are traveling in straight lines. Sorry, I have to keep saying this, but you know, it's important to remember that actually these balls are traveling in straight lines. Um, and then I want, just wanted to know, like, what would it be like to have multiple balls interacting in this environment where all you could work with is straight lines? Because if you say it that way, it sounds kind of boring, right? I'm going to move balls and they're only going to travel in straight lines. Um, but I think there's some interesting stuff to discover in here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then we write the other rule. We can spin in a circle while, um, while we throw balls in straight lines. So this is what that looks like. And then kind of the third observation, which is that uh, we can spin the camera with the, um, you know, with me while I am spinning. Um, and you get, you'll note that the camera is spinning when the background um, becomes, right, when the stars in the background are, are spinning like that. And just to mention the star background is um, the Aquila constellation. Um, so let's like look at this rotation thing a little bit more closely. On the left side, you'll have a non-rotating frame. You can see this ball is just moving straight along those um, purple dashed lines. Okay, so just knows it moves straight down. Now on the right side, we're going to look at it in the rotating frame. And um, you can see again, it's just moving straight down that dotted, right, the dotted line. Um, but now the whole reference frame is turning. And so now we're going to start tracking that ball. Um, sorry, a bug flew in my face. Um, and you can kind of see that makes this like kind of interesting curve when it's going through the middle like that. But now we're going to modify this a little bit. We're going to go just a little bit further. So this is 180 degree rotation. You can see a little bit more of that curve and start to question like, uh, maybe there's something more here than we're, we saw in that first version. And then now we're going to go 360 degrees. Now you can see that it really uh, is becoming something. And this is something we call an Archimedean spiral. And so uh, curves that are going from the center like this always become Archimedean spirals. That means it, as it becomes a spiral, it's always one step out further from the last time that it passed that same angle. So, you know, if, it, if it's one foot out after one rotation, then it'll be two feet out after two rotations. Um, and what's neat is it, that um, I'm not usually throwing from the middle in space struggling. I'm throwing from the side through the middle or through some cord close to the middle. And so we can just take a look at that real quick. And, um, you can see, it, oh, oh, did we get it? Come on, come on, be alive. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can see what happens if we throw from one side to the other side, we get an Archimedean spiral going in toward the middle, and then we get an Archimedean spiral coming out the other side. And so that pattern just ends up getting repeated. Now, what if though we throw it back to the same place, right, in the rotating frame, because this is juggling and we're going to throw and catch, right, and the throws and the catches generally are happening on the outside, then we end up getting this like whole set of other types of shapes, which I think is just particularly interesting. And I love that, uh, you know, something you're not expecting and not looking for, and then pop, there it is. Um, so here's three throws to three different locations uh, around the circle, but then on the right side, you can see if you're spinning and you throw and catch in the same place that they end up making different types of curves. Um, then this, these again are three throws to different places. Uh, and in this particular structure, you can see that one of them makes kind of this loop, the green one, and then the purple one does a, a cusp. And then if you throw it back to the same place, then you can end up getting uh, these types of patterns. And I do use all of these in space juggling. And then finally, this is what I consider the space juggling tech tree that kind of shows like all of the possible pattern structures within, um, you know, this formal system, which of course you can do other stuff other than just exactly what I'm describing here, but just only using this uh, technique. Those are the, the patterns that you would get. And so we recorded one set of patterns where we had the camera spinning in one 
situation and we had the camera not spinning in another, but I'm doing the same pattern. And so on the left, you can see the non-rotating situation and you can see the ball travels basically in a straight line. And the right, you can see uh, kind of the curve that the ball travels around in the rotating frame. And um, both of these things are true. The ball is traveling in a straight line and the ball is traveling in the curve. Now in this one, um, this is what I call an anti-shower where um, you throw from the leading hand to the lagging hand and you end up getting this pattern that you see on the right side where the ball comes back over and crosses its trajectory um, in between the times that you're touching it. And I think that's just, again, incredibly interesting, very inconsistent with our experience of object manipulation on earth where everything travels in parabolas, right? Uh, this is a parallel pattern. So on the left side, you can see that I'm throwing the balls basically parallel to each other. And then on the right side, you can see what kind of shapes they make. And interestingly, the one that's close to my face makes a different pattern than the one that's farther away from my face. The farther away one on the right makes that big loop. The close one kind of goes down, stops, and changes direction. And it either does the little loop or it does the, the cusp type of pattern. So of course I um, started investigating that. I am a physicist and now I have the equation that you see on the left side. And what this is, is this is an equation that represents every single pattern that you see on the right side uh, where uh, big omega two is the catching hand, big omega one is the throwing hand, tau is the amount of time between the throw and the catch. And then uh, T is time, omega zero is the angular velocity of the, the person as you're spinning. And um, I do have a Mathematica notebook um, on the Mathematica community forums. It got into the staff pick section. So if you, um, you know, if you're a Mathematica user, then you might uh, hop on there and you can kind of play around with this pattern a little bit. But what was interesting, oh uh, yeah, did I mention I find everything about this interesting? Um, what was interesting is that I wondered like, you know, I, no, obviously, well, not obviously, but I haven't found anybody else who's worked on a type of juggling like this, right? So then what are other ways that people might be investigating these similar types of patterns so that I can like find a little bit of a wave to ride, you know, find some collaborators to talk to. And uh, I thought, I wonder if this is similar to how object trajectories would work in rotating spaceships, except it's the other way that you're throwing up rather than throwing down um, into the circle, right? You're still throwing into the circle, but you throw up into the circle when you're inside of a rotating spaceship. And so I found this guy, Ted Hall, who he was curious about um, object trajectories and the fact that when you're in a rotating spaceship, it um, you can tell uh, that you're in artificial gravity. It does not uh, simulate gravity perfectly. Uh, a good example is if you're in a rotating spaceship and you hold a ball at your head and you just drop it, it's going to actually drift off to the side. So this um, 10 to the one, that's uh, a rotating spaceship with a 10 meter diameter. And these are all rotating uh, so that they give a centrifugal force of one earth gravity. Um, if it has a hundred meter diameter, then it still falls by about 10 centimeters off to the side. This is about one meter off to the side. Um, if you have a thousand meter spaceship and it's spinning so quickly that you get one gravity then um and that's a thousand meter radius then you end up uh still falling about eight centimeters off to the side so this is a real effect that you know if you were in an artificial gravity environment you could still tell that you are and uh what i was so excited about when i was looking at ted's work was that he identified this particular drop condition to correlate with a mathematical structure called an involute. And um, we can construct an involute by taking a circle and taking a line and then rolling the line along the circle without the line slipping. And we can make a little more sense out of that by following a point on the line. So we're going to illuminate a point here, bam, just like that. And then now as the line rolls around the circle, we'll follow that point. It's called a generator. And this is called an involute. And so that's what the shape is when you just drop a ball, or if it comes in from the side and it stops and changes direction, it makes this pattern. And that's the version that I work with. Now, uh, I had mentioned at some point um, that there were these Archimedean spirals that I had identified. And it turns out that using a similar structure to um, the uh, involute that I, I was just describing um, can 
be used to generate an Archimedean spiral, specifically if the point you follow is set off to the side and the direction of the circle and the distance from the line to the circle is the radius of the circle, then it ends up producing this uh, Archimedean spiral. So bam, now we have what I did and we have what Ted did connected through the same basic geometric shape uh, and setup. And so this is more what I do, you know, I throw from the side and it goes through the middle. So that's actually kind of one of the patterns that I work with. And so I started really wondering, is there a generalization of all of the patterns that I'm working with? And it turns out, yes, if you take these um, points that you're tracking to be offset by any, uh, any distance, um, then you get a full mapping from this set of roulettes, which this is what it is called when you take a line curve, roll another curve along it, and then track a point that's called a roulette. Um, and the curves that I'm working with. And other types of roulettes that you may be familiar with are um, cycloids, hypocycloids, trochoids, um, you know, spirograph kind of shapes, um, stuff like that. Um, so just to mention, um, this stuff does, these are solutions to Coriolis and centrifugal force differential equations. Um, people have studied that for a long time and think they know everything just because they can write down the answers, uh, but I think they don't. And that's because nobody else is, oh, I still have pedal curves on there. This should say, say roulettes. Um, I have not found any other instance where somebody else has identified that the solutions to the Coriolis and centrifugal force differential equations uh, are satisfied by roulettes generated by a circle and a line, not even in the 16,000 words and 74 references on the Wikipedia page, which lots of people like to tell me to go look at when they think they're explaining this topic to me. And so um, I would say, uh, I think there's still something to learn even in mathematics and in structures that we think we understand already. Like, okay, we can make simulations of it. That's great. That um, doesn't mean that you understand it. And so, um, you know, I think we're just gonna roll this out uh, with this last piece. And so what I'm gonna do is um, just show you some more space juggling. This is from the International Jugglers Association um, competition, which was held in July. And I had not presented this work uh, fully prior to this um, presentation. And so this is um, a, uh, yeah, so this is a video of, um, of that work. And, um, and I did end up winning the competition. So that was pretty awesome.
All right. So, um, you know, what you can expect uh, in the near future, I'm going to be releasing a theatrical short uh, of this uh, called Dreaming of Space Juggling. I'll also be releasing a behind the scenes video. Um, and if you want to be tuned into those things, then um, sign up for the newsletter on my website, The Space Juggler. Um, and just mention I am on social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so kind of, you know, what I started with this with and what I wanted to reiterate at this point is that, um, you know, I've done this amount of work on this project over two years as a professional circus performer and as a, uh, you know, person with a PhD in physics, who's, I'm working at a university doing physics, right? And still, I keep finding new things to investigate. Still, I keep finding new questions. And, um, and this is a topic that like, you know, people think they understand Coriolis and centrifugal forces. And I, and, you know, I keep finding new stuff there. And so, you know, when you're working on your thing, it's just like, keep, keep going because I'm sure there is more for you to find. Um, and all right, I think uh, we'll, we'll stop listening to me talk <laughs> so intensely uh, for a little bit and move on to the question and answer section. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. That was entrancing, I'll have to say. Um, we thank you for being here and showing us that. Um, we'll open up the Q&A to participants. If you want to toss your questions in the chat, um, we'll bring those to Adam to comment on. Um, uh, while people are doing that, I'll start with one of my own. Um, this process of juggling in this very non-intuitive way, does it ever become intuitive? It's just kind of like yes, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, and it um, it's kind of it's weird because I spent a lot of time developing it. In which case, I think all processes of development need to go through a a non censorship phase, right? Where you just like do whatever works and just keep doing it. Um, but then once I decided I was really going to make it a piece and I was going to perform it, then it was like, okay, I got to get real about this. I got to like dig in. And I just practiced the same eight patterns for six months straight. And um, through kind of like refining it down to that and just doing that subset of flip throws, then after I did that six months, then I was able to like expand a little bit more because I now like did understand something well. Um, and so, yeah, you can acclimate to it. And another level of acclimation was when I started it, if I span, spun for five minutes, I would like get up and be stumbling around and fall against the wall or whatever. And by the end, um, like in those videos that you saw, I could spend for 30 minutes straight hop off, be balancing on a ladder, like climb down the thing, no problem at all. And so there, there's a lot of things that you can acclimate to through a practice like this. Yeah, that's incredible to hear about the level of acclimation. Um, question the chat here is if you tried it on a parabolic flight. I know you said you did all eight tests um, on the flights, but I'm curious if you've done it or, you know, we're getting this question if you've done it since with your kind of more advanced um, expertise in it? And then also, um, if not, do you have plans to, is that a place you're gonna play with this? So I have not done it yet. Um, I still have been a little bit cautious about going on a parabolic flight with the current you know, environment. And so um, I, I thought that's what I was training for. Um, but the cool thing to note is that like, I couldn't have made the video that you saw on a parabolic flight because you only get 20 to 30 seconds of zero G and parabolas, but I was able to do a continuous five minute piece only because I had built this apparatus. And, um, and I am probably going to try doing some throwing in a parabolic flight, but I don't feel the pressure to try to repeat what I've done because I feel like it's been demonstrated and somebody else can go do that. And I'm happy for them. And I, I would move on to something else if I um, really have an opportunity to say, do three parabolic flight camp, like a three parabolic flight campaign, you know, 15 or 60 parabolas or something like that. If I was gonna do an art piece, I would not do this um, because I've said what I needed to say. Right, like that's there. Go for it. Go for it, everybody. <laughs> you know, um, I'm I'm gonna move on to the next thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nip, do you want to pick your question out? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was amazing. <laughs> um, so my question is for someone who might be interested in trying this out for themselves, uh, what do you think they need in terms of experience, like bodily experience? So setting aside the sort of technical objects like the harness and whatnot that someone would need, or, you know, access to parabolic flight regularly to practice. Um, what sort of experience do you think somebody needs to get going with this or what sort of foundation? To get going with um, development of movement and weightlessness, you mean? Or get, uh, yeah, refine, can you refine your question just a little yeah. bit more for me? Yeah. So if I wanted to be another space juggler, if I wanted to like move, like it seems, it seems like there was quite a bit of strain on your body, basically, in order to get this going. And you just spoke about that. And so even with your years of experience in the circus, it seems like it was quite strenuous. And so do you think that that sort of experience is even necessary to get started? Or how would you recommend that somebody with that who is not <laughs> like myself, who has no experience with, with circus performance, um, get started with, with trying to practice space juggling? Yeah, uh, well, learning to juggle, I think, will be helpful because you can practice that more often uh, than you would be able to practice space juggling. Um, I grew up on boats uh, in Florida, not like I grew up on a boat, but, you know, my, my grandparents owned a marina, and so I was on and off of boats all the time, and so that seems to have really helped with my vestibular robustness. And I have had a little bit of an issue of when I get other people in my harness, uh, their stomachs don't quite last um, throughout a whole evening of practice, you know, and that is an important thing to keep in mind because, of course, people don't like to go back and repeat activities that they previously vomited during, you know, and so it um, it's it's something that yeah, I, I've been trying to figure out like, uh, yeah, where's that where's that edge with most folks, um, and so. So it's good to have games that challenge your vestibular system so that you can start to acclimate that to that because um, consequences of having vestibular disorientation are like headaches, which can last for days for some people. Um, nausea, obviously, uh, inability to concentrate, and then you know even more extreme physical responses. So I'd say like doing things that challenge your vestibular system are going to be helpful for that. So being on the merry-go-round, spinning on the thing really quickly in the park or whatever. Um, as far as like getting access to things and how that can help, uh, as in other environments, uh, I kind of named a few at one point that I use very regularly, which are wind tunnels, right? Like indoor skydiving uh, type of thing. Um, pools, especially if you can be in a heated pool that you don't wear a vest in, like no, you know, scoop of gear or anything. And then you can just go underwater and start like moving and feeling um, how your body responds. Um, there, there is a little bit of a difference between weightlessness and water practice because what we're, you know, one of the fundamental components of our proprioceptive uh, interpretation of what's going on in the world, and I'll back that up even further and say your proprioception is your mental map of what's going on in the world as well as what's going on in your body and how your body interacts with the environment, right? That this is like, a, oh, this is a very developed map that we all have. And a very intricate part of that map is your vestibular system, which tells you the orientation of gravity, how quickly your head is moving through space, how quickly it is turning. And then you have pressure on your you know, feet, on your butt, on your back, whatever, where you're supported by the ground. And then you know you can use force in order to engage in locomotion to get from one place to another. And that's how we build our map of the world is like, what can we reach? What can we run to? What can we walk to? All of these things. And uh, in weightlessness, you don't have that, right? Which messes up your whole proprioceptive environment. So when you're underwater, if you work on not pushing against the water, 
but instead just to move slowly and extend your arms and legs in different directions and see how that changes the orientation of your body as you're stretching your arms one way, as you're kind of like bringing your torso in, whatever, then um, that's like invaluable. You really, that's like water for most people is pretty accessible. And I, I would strongly encourage anybody who wants to develop these types of skills to be thinking about water practice, yeah. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, if I may, Colin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. We've got one in the chat, but um, it segues. So let's follow okay. up and then move over. Great. So on that point, and getting sort of into the philosophical points that you raised earlier about this and the, the sort of human nature um, and the the conception of the human that that this sort of uh, this practice raises, this what you just said, this sort of we seem to have an implicit assumption of an external world that is built into our engagement with the world or reality or whatever. Um, I'm not going to be philosophically rigorous about that. Uh, <laughs> about Thank that you. I'm sure you could talk circles around me. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I'm wondering, it sounds like with your talking about the practice in water, there's a sort of recentering of around ourselves and around our body when we critique this sort of implicit or you've unearthed a sort of implicit assumption about the world and, and what the world is like. And there's a sort of recentering on the body that occurs. Do you think that that's a fair way to think about part of what you've done or one way to think about what you've done here? And where do you think we can go with developing what human what humans and our bodies may be capable of if we think about that sort of recentering um, around around the physical structure of of the body instead of assuming the sort of thing that we can push against I love this question. It's it's like you're you're a, a ringer or something. It's like I put you there to ask that question. Honestly, everybody, I didn't I did not have any previous suggestion that he should be asking this question. So um, the the kind of two of the ways, and these are kind of the two primary ways that I know about about how people um, describe the reference frame in which you are operating is either it's an allocentric reference frame, which means that it's outside of the body, or it's an egocentric reference frame, which means it's inside of your body. And um, you know, in a lot of cultures, we have this conflict between like what's good for the individual and what's good for the community. And we have a, you know, very negative perception of egocentrism and like, you know, the, uh, being egotistical is bad and, you know, all of these things. On the other hand, you know, just kind of off the cuff and off the cheek, I'd say egos have a very important purpose. Um, they keep us going, <laughs> you know, like we, we don't want to dissolve all of them apparently, um, because that's, that's really one of the key components in getting us to where we're at right now. Uh, and we haven't had a physical representation or a physical environment prior to the embodied experience in space where the body itself can be free of influence in a lot of ways from other environmental factors. Of course, you still want to be soaking in something filled with oxygen, but other than that, right, like you don't have to have a lot of the other environmental pressures that we're used to having um, when we're on earth. And so this actually, I think, opens up the channel for an embodied representation of a type of individualism that we do discuss in Western cultures and idolize a bit without, um, without needing to bring all that other baggage along with it and starting to wonder like, what does the body look like in, in its solitude, right? In its environment where really you're only in contact with oxygen. And, um, and in that way, I have been, and, and also I got to uh, give props back to Kitsu Dubois. So she is a French choreographer and dancer. She started studying zero G dance in 1990. 
um, and she's in Paris and she has done 21 parabolic flights. And I've had the honor of um, bringing her to the United States for her first workshops with Americans at Smith College in 2019. Um, and I'm working with her to get her book translated right now, which is the first book about zero G dance written by a zero G dancer. Yes, that's gonna be awesome. I want this in English. And um, she says that when you go into weightlessness, uh, because your proprioceptive uh, structures are all undermined, you know, you, you can't even use the same channels of connection that you're used to. What happens is like your world closes down and you become just eyes. But even more than that, your body is freaking out. And so you have tunnel vision on top of only being able to use your eyes as the only thing that you can actually get input about the environment from. And so you have to first like reoccupy your ocular space. Then you have to learn how to reoccupy the rest of your body. At which point, rather than using a two-dimensional mapping of the world, which appears to be the way that um, you know, mice and rats and other um, primates and things do, um, you know, with grid cells and head direction cells and place cells and all of this. If you look at like hippocampus research, um, then you see all of that, uh, right? It seems realistic that surface dwellers map things in two dimension, but in weightlessness, we now have a three dimensional environment. And Kitsu describes that our remapping can come from our bodies outward. And so starting from our center of mass, we now can extend radially out from the center of mass to our extended limbs. And that is the unit by which we can measure the space around us. And through that uh, new form of measurement related to the self, I think that we um, can develop a new sense in relationship to us and I personally have been calling it the solip sense um, because of course solipsism is like everybody, you know, you don't want that. But um, I think the solip sense is something that could be very useful. You know, it's like, what does the world look like from you out? And that that's an okay question. And I think we're tackling it in a lot of other arenas, you know, uh, and this just gives us a very clear physical representation of one of the ways that we can study this uh, to find out what the philosophical and psychological things that arise from it are, rather than, um, you know, kind of being mired in the emotional turmoil that often come with having to express yourself to the world from inside out, you know. Um, and so I hope that kind of skirted your question at the very least <laughs> yeah it sounds like that solid sense is a new one might think new type of relation with the world and so is sort of undermining and critiquing the solipsism that you you know that you're playing on there so it's great it's fantastic thank you thank you so much thank you for hearing me yeah <laughs> yeah thank you i agree on that i think there's something to be said about Mm, Reattuning embodiment in a particular way that allows us to create new re relationality to each other as well. As you talked about, like, what is the baggage of uh, the ego that we take with that kind of individualistic view? And so breaking that down with this new sense could be very interesting. Um, we'll leave that up to the future and what gets developed there. Um, question in the chat here is about your structure in the barn. And um, they're asking if it's a permanent structure, if you have new projects going into the space. Um, so maybe an expansion on kind of what the art practice art space feels like and its future. Yeah, I am uh, not currently planning further artistic development in the barn. Um, I have found a, at least one other collaborator who's coming up with some space struggling ideas that I haven't had. Uh, I can't tell you how happy I was when I, I had that those first uh, YouTube videos going up that they were like, yeah, this is, you know, this is in, in response to that. And, um, you know, for two years, I kind of kept, I didn't tell anybody about it. And so this was fun to see it. So that's one project that's going on is just kind of being like, okay, let's flesh this out before I put it down for a little while. Um, and the... This rotating thing with the the trajectories, you know, kind of being all these weird shapes, um, 
And looking at Ted Hall's work, who have now been in contact with the um, guy who uh, did the rotating uh, spaceship uh, work, he um, had in one of his, the end of his a paper from 1990, he had a paper, a picture of a fountain um, going in one of those cur curves. And that really got me inspired. And so I think next year, one of my projects is going to be to build a fountain that can be filmed to make these uh, different curves and different shapes. Um, because A, that'd be beautiful. B, it shows us one more kind of like layer of what it'll look like to be in a rotating space habitat. And, um, and I think it's just a good technical challenge. Uh, I like hard things and I like doing hard things. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I have more projects. Uh, this is, this is just one of the, um, the ones that was already in motion, uh, when the pandemic began. And so if you like this and you like this blend of circus science and zero gravity, then, um, stay tuned and follow my stuff because I am by no means done. My objective, just so, so, you know, is that I want to build the infrastructure which we need so that more artists can go into the future and be ready to develop the next layer. Because right now we just don't have it. There's just nobody who's talking about it. You know, everybody knows we want to do flips in space. Nobody wants to tell you how to do flips in space. And so that's what I'm trying to do. It's like, how is this actually going to happen? Where is circus, you know, space circus going to come from? It's going to come from this type of work. And so, um, so yeah, that's like kind of my, my lifetime objective is just keep picking away, keep adding, adding to the, the, the long book <laughs> that's going to be this art form or this set of art forms in the future, you know, hopefully. Remember, it's not inevitable that we get to space. This is not inevitable. It still is going to take a ton of work. We have to do the work. It's, you know, <laughs> do not think that humanity uh, inhabiting the entire solar system is just going to happen on its own. No, absolutely. And under what conditions, that's also kind of the question that Spiros is asking. Um, on that account, I'm just going to plug us really quick. We have a lot more events coming up. Uh, my colleague Nick will be putting some of those in the chat. And I want to I encourage other folks, if you have questions, throw them in the chat, raise your hand, I want to get you in here. Um, I have another one here we're going to bring up saying the calves you've been playing with are really beautiful. Um, and asking what kind of artwork inspired your practice? You know, what, outside of maybe circus or maybe specific things in circus would be good, but out of circus generally, other artwork um, that's inspiring your practice. Mm. Um, yeah, I. So one interesting thing is there's this guy Greg Kennedy who is a um, he's an engineer and he. Um, did juggling in a hemisphere and juggling in a cone where he um, was rolling balls on the inside of a hemisphere, you know, it was like open down. And so the balls would go this way. And then he put a mirror above it so that you could, you know, see it from above uh, while you're in the audience. And, um, and then he did juggling a cone where he's standing inside of a cone that's coming down and he's rolling balls on the, the inside of the cone. Um, so that they're kind of, you know, going down and coming around behind him and he can do seven balls and all this stuff. And it was interesting because when I had this idea to roll the balls on the ground as a result of talking to Story Musgrave, um, kind of in retrospect, I realized that I don't know if I would have considered that a juggling possibility had I not seen Greg Kennedy's work. And it's not that my work was trying to imitate what he did. You know, it wasn't that I said, oh, well, he did it on this surface and he did it on that surface. And so I'm going to do it on a different surface in order to make my thing different, right? Fundamentally, it came from a different place, right? Kind of like crabs all converging in the same, uh, same uh, evolutionary trajectory. Sorry, you guys aren't laughing enough at that joke. There's like five evolutionary trajectories that result in crab, uh, right? So it's like the crabification of, of species. Um, and so anyways, I didn't know, or, you know, I wasn't expecting to do this technique that was similar to Greg Kennedy's, but I don't know if I would have considered it juggling had he not done that. And so it's like, you never know what things you do are going to allow someone else to do something bec just because it kind of like put it in a frame that said, this is still juggling. 
And so, um, so that was one of the artistic works that I like really wasn't trying to mimic, but I have to admit that it had a significant impact on what I think of as juggling. And um, of course, I would really love to, um, to make some more developed works with the, um, with the curves um, so that people can just kind of see them more, get more familiar with them. The thing to understand, because I've made this um, uh, connection to the rotating space habitat environment, is that just like you're used to things traveling in parabolas, or maybe you're not, and you drop a lot of things all the time. You know, <laughs> um, if you're a juggler, you're very used to things traveling in parabolas. Um, the people who are living on rotating space habitats, these are the curves that they're going to be used to, right? These are the curves that you see in space juggling are the the natural pathways that everyone in that environment is going to be acclimated to. And so, um, although it feels really contrived in some ways. It is also really natural in a lot of ways because it's going to be true for all rotating spaceships. And that's just, that really blows my mind, man. No, same. I'm a big fan of science fiction. So I've read a lot of like Kim Stanley Robinson's walk and he puts a lot of things within rotating environments. And this is an aspect that's not touched on. Um, so I think you're really bringing something extremely useful to how we think about space and what living in it will be like. Um, so that's extremely valuable. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I'm looking for anything else in the chat. We might wrap up soon. Um, so if anyone does have anything, get your hand up there. Um, I'll just ask a quick one myself. You're talking about um, these cones, etc., And I'm thinking, what you're doing right now is very much um, still 2D juggling, so to speak. And I'm curious if there's a way to, or a thought of what you're doing, but in a sphere or something else that makes it three-dimensional where you start playing with extra dimension with that. Yeah, so I have had a little bit of a chance to play in a sphere because there, there's, um, have you seen these people in a bubble, like standing on water or whatever, like doing acrobatics? Um, so we, our circus has one of those. So I've gotten inside of that and like rolled balls around on the inside. Of course, it's still affected by gravity. And so that is what it is. Um, but I have been trying pretty hard to imagine what some three-dimensional patterns would look like. You know, what's it like to be moving forward and backward in space and behind your head and all. And like when you can actually spin your body around a different axis and you're throwing back to yourself or whatever. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, I can imagine some things and I could say some stuff out loud, but I can also say, I know prior to this work that I had thrown more than 10 million times on earth. I had been doing it for 15 years. I had been really dedicated to object manipulation and it still took me like a thousand hours to get good at this, you know? And so it's like, it does, it also feels kind of like immature or disrespectful or something to say like, oh yeah, you could do this or you could do that without like practicing it you know, because it's like a lot easier to say something than it is to do it. And you have no idea what the really hard thing is. Um, and so it's funny because I want to have an answer to that. And then I also feel like because I can't practice it, I can't speak to it sincerely, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I appreciate that. Um, something I was thinking about is even in your kind of 2D spinning in space, I imagine that your motions would really affect your momentum and thus the speed you're spitting at and make that yeah, really difficult. So, yeah, so that there, um, one of the things that um, you'll notice is my legs are free, right? I mm -hmm. definitely could have tied my legs up um, and my arms are free. And one of the things, if you watch, when you watch the videos again, when, <laughs> if you watch the videos again, um, you'll notice that I extend my arms out and then I rotate them and then I bring them in toward my chest. Mm -hmm. Then I extend out and I rotate. Then I bring them in toward my chest. Because if I rotated and then I left my arms out while I went back, then I actually would be slowing down when I was moving my arms back to their initial position. And so this was something that um, I had thought about putting myself on a motor 
at some point. But then when I realized that I was doing this and that I was using my leg distance in order to control my speed, that if the legs are extended, you go slower. If the legs are contracted, you go faster. Um, that like those were important, real physical components of the activity. And I wanted this to be as physically relevant and physically realistic as possible. And so I've got like body spins around in the cartwheel. You can use your arms and legs to change your moment of inertia. Uh, balls are traveling in straight lines. The Aquila constellation is properly represented. The balls can travel in a, um, in a plane, you know, like I really did my best to, to get this as close to like what it could really be like as possible. And, um, and so I'm really happy to hear you ask those questions because I see that you like, you get why moving the arms and legs around changes the um, way that your angular momentum and your moment of inertia interplay. And, um, and I do ha actually have a technical paper called um, Choreographic Techniques for Human Bodies and Weightlessness, which is, was published in Acta, Acta Astronautica earlier this year. And in it, I study and uh, report on three different investigations into styles of um, what we call self rotations, where you're not touching anything, the total body's angular momentum is zero, but then you can change your orientation um, by, by moving your arms and legs around. And so if this is something that um, you or somebody would be interested in finding out more about, um, the, that's a place to look, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so we don't want to keep you past time. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, to everyone who showed up, thank you for attending. Uh, follow Ernest Pilas, follow Adam. There's more stuff coming up on both accounts. So this has been a fantastic evening. Thank you. Uh, any closing words, Nick? Anything else to add? No, just thank you, Adam. Thank you to everyone who came out tonight. This was an amazing talk and an amazing demonstration of what we can do and shows that we do not yet know what a body can do, as, as Benedict Spinoza would say. Um, and so Adam, thank you for thank you for living that philosophy and questioning, making us question what we can do and opening up the horizons of what the human can do. Really appreciate it. You're yeah, a real, you. you're a true, a true trailblazer. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much for having me. This was super fun. I uh, really, I, yeah, I had a great time tonight. And so I uh, look forward to seeing more of what y'all are doing in the future. This, this next talk looks great. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you have the last word. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.